time to buy the dip with the Buckeyes. It is a midseason stock watch on the podcast daily. It's Wednesday. That's Bill Landis and Jeremy Birmingham. I am Austin Ward. And there are a lot more Ohio State stocks available for lower prices than a week ago. Now is the time to load up. Where would you begin, Bill? Uh, I'll I'll begin with something uh, that I think is is good, and I and I actually thought was a nice development in in the Oregon game, and that was uh, being impressed with Will Howard um, for the majority of that game. And I, I, I I'd imagine if people choose to look back on this game, they they will remember how it ended. Um, unfortunately for Will, but even even that moment with the slide, it's like guy's trying to make a play to help his team win the game and like he slid a half second later <laughs> than he should have slid and if he if he makes that a different decision i think we're having very different conversations so um i thought some of the throws he made on that last drive were awesome i thought he really kind of met the moment with the majority of his play in that game and i do think it was a valid question about him right there was a lot of talk about will howard going in, into that game you know how he would handle the environment, how he might handle the stakes that that he had played in games of some magnitude while he was at Kansas State, and and certainly had played in some tough stadiums, but probably nothing quite like what Ohio State experienced on Saturday in in Eugene. And and I thought he checked a lot of boxes. I, I maybe would have liked to see him run a little more, but that's a I think it's more of a play call thing than it is like a will being hesitant to do so kind of thing. And and I bet. The next time Ohio State is in a game of that magnitude, he will run more. Um, but I, I, I thought he played well. Like I, I found almost everything I saw from Will to be pretty encouraging. And so, if there's uh, stock available in him moving forward as a guy who can play well in big games for Ohio State, I, I actually thought he showed me enough to to tell me that he can. Yeah, I think the unfortunate thing is what you said, like. There's a lot of people who are going to look at that game and think about the last play. They're going to think about the third and three drop snap and not going to think about the 80%, not going to think about the way he was, uh, you know, bailing the Buckeyes offense out multiple times, getting out of the pocket and extending plays. And w when the offensive line was uh, forced to to make some major adjustments in the in the late first half and second half. And uh, I am more confident. And Will, Will Howard was going to be my first buy here uh, as well. So I'm just going to chime in. Like, I... I if I had any doubt about his ability to win a national championship for Ohio State, it's gone now. And, and that that's not something I would have expected to gain like confidence in in a, in a loss, uh, but that I absolutely did. Well, the, the scramble play doesn't matter if he doesn't make any of the other throws that you guys have already talked about. Like, it wouldn't have come down to that last play. Ohio State would not have been even in position to win they wouldn't have been competitive in the second half when they weren't able to run the ball when they were operating without josh simmons at left tackle didn't have will kazmarek out there to block or i mean he got injured on a 32 yard pass play down the field so not losing a weapon you're losing a blocker tegra shabola was injured will howard created a lot of things out of um very little in some circumstances and I, the touchdown to jeremiah smith i remember talking to burm about it on saturday night was Great feel in the pocket, extending a play helps to have Jeremiah Smith, of course, in a lot of situations. But like, he did the things that he had to do to win the game. Like to pin it, any of that on Will Howard because of the scramble at the end is folly to me. Yeah, I mean, he's it's the nature of the position, right? He's the guy that has the ball in his hand last, so so it, it comes with the territory, and I'm I'm sure Will knows how to handle it. You know, I, I like what I saw and heard from him sort of post game for, for whatever that matters to, to people. So um, it's for me, it's about, do you make more winning plays than you do than, than you don't? And and I thought he certainly made more winning plays in that game than the drop, like the drop snap. Really? I think the drop snap is probably the only like bad play he made. It's like, even the, I don't, I don't count really the slide as a bad play. It was a, a broke a bad luck maybe, or just like a slight hesitancy, but it was not, it wasn't a bad decision. I don't think. Yeah, I mean, obviously, people are going to continue to have their questions about the deep ball ability, but like, it, in my mind, if you're throwing one ball down the field a game that's further than 25 yards because that's what the offense is calling, that's not on Will Howard. I mean, I don't know how much they're practicing that in how many reps you're getting a, a week trying to throw the ball 40, 50 yards down the field. But I feel like if you want him to be better at it, then the Buckeyes need to do it more often. And I, mm -hmm. I do. I don't think they're really trying that. Which I mean, that's frustrating. But I don't put that on Will. I, I just don't. I haven't been able to find any real frustration with it because I don't think that the offense needs it. 
I think the offense did suffer from a lack of explosive plays a little bit, just because they're so debilitating in a game like that. Um, like they they move the ball fine, and, and thirty one points should be enough to win you. <clears throat> excuse me, most games. But I, I if they weren't going to get the, you know, forty yard slants and screens that they were getting earlier in the game, I would probably like to see it another way of getting some explosives aside from. The Trayvon Henderson run and the and the one pass down the field to Jeremiah Smith because they, that they're so important. That's all any coaches ever talk about in games like this is: can you stop explosives? Can you manufacture them? So you have to have multiple ways to manufacture them. And I guess I don't know that Ohio State is incapable of doing it by throwing it down the field. I, I but I get maybe the concern just based off the fact that we haven't seen them do it a whole lot yet. But I do think to Berm's point that might be more about calls than ability. Yeah, because again, you're doing it once a game. And yeah, the one time they did it on Saturday, the ball was under thrown, but well got hit pretty good on that play. Like again, there's a lot of things that go into each of these things. But like to me, anybody who's questioning Will Howard as the quarterback of this team or if he's the right guy is is just looking for something to be mad about. Okay. Do you have a non Will Howard stock to watch, Burn? Uh, I mean, is there any Travion Henderson stock left? I just love everything about Travion Henderson right now. And I, I I get the sentiment of why people were upset that the Buckeyes didn't run the ball more in the second half, even though what when they were, it wasn't effective, even though you're replacing, you know, 40% of your offensive line. I mean, I, I get the the reasons for um, maybe the Buckeyes turning to Will Howard in the passing offense because it was so effective uh, and, and able to move the ball so well. I don't really think Oregon stopped Ohio State's offense. I mean, let's be clear. The Buckeyes stopped themselves. They only had four possessions in the second half. And one of them ends at the end of the, you know, the end of the game, one of them ends with Will Howard dropping a snap on third and three and the other two, the Buckeyes scored on. So I, I don't really consider that Oregon was stopping them. So I, I don't argue the point that maybe, um, you know, you'd like to mix it up a little bit or, you know, first and 10 from the 28, maybe you, you run a draw, there, run a draw play there and you get eight to 10 yards and you don't have to deal with the uh, officials calling bad uh, OPI, but. And Travion, just the explosion, the ability to be a game breaker. I just want them to find more ways to get him involved in the game. And and I think that there's ways to do that, whether it's the screen game. I mean, people lament the passing, the screen game, the, the tunnel screens and that kind of stuff. But if you're running a running back screen, I think that people probably don't complain half as much. So uh, just find ways to get him in the game because he still clearly is a an absolute game breaker. And you saw... You know, Quinshawn, that maybe that Oregon defense is not the type of game for him to really have the big plays in, but Travion and his electricity, that's what he does. I mean, he he's a game breaker. And um the the way he stepped up in pass protection, the way he's become um the leader of this team, like I, I just love everything about the kid. And I'm trying to be positive here on this episode of the Stonk Watch. Um, so I'm gonna lean into the guys who are really just stepping up on and off the field, and that's Travion. He he's been incredible. Bill, don't fact check this, but I don't remember Ohio State running a running back screen since the comeback at Penn State. I think it's been like four years. Yeah, like a pure slow screen kind of play. They've certainly had like check downs to the running back, but I don't. I'm sure it's happened. I can't think of one off the top of my head either. Yeah, it's just it's weird that it's so non-existent. And we saw even in camp more opportunities aside from check down like wheel routes to Travion Henderson or Quinshawn Judkins and like, hey, these guys can catch the football and you can get them in matchups against linebackers where they're going to win. Uh, I don't, it feels like a, another weird nitpick because there's so many other things that we can talk about. Like Ohio State scored enough points to win the game. So I don't know. Asking for them to do different things on offense with the play calling, whether, including the deep ball or screens or involving the running backs in the passing game. Like, I'm not sure that we're, but that's a great use of our time, to be honest. I, I think it's an interesting point, perhaps moving forward, depending on what the offensive line looks like and is capable of. Um, right. If you want to get into more more screens and more um, more running backs involved, Quinshawn Judkins and Travion Henderson both have eight targets this year. Um, Bryson Rogers also has eight to help put that in perspective. So it has not been a major part of the offense, but also I think a part of that and why it might be falling short of what we've seen in previous years is that Will Howard has not often taken his check down to the running back either. So that, that actually factors in too. I will continue talking about the offense, however, which is a stock up on G Scott jr, which I 
I didn't know that it was ever going to connect for him at a level where he could be counted on to play 40, 50, 60 snaps for Ohio State because you knew that he would be able to handle some of the, the route running and he can catch the football and he came as a wide receiver. That stuff's well known. But I think the physical development, uh, the ability to hold up as a blocker, not an elite blocker, but one that Ohio State can trust to get through has been encouraging. He deserves credit for that, where I don't often point to it enough, maybe. Uh, and it's more important than ever because Will Kaczmarek is going to be out for a while. Ryan Day uh, talked about that again on Monday night on the roundtable. Uh, don't know if that means for the rest of the regular season or what with that arm or shoulder issue that had him out look, that came on that throw in the middle or on the first drive of the game. Like G Scott's going to have to be really good. I don't know what the opportunities will look like as Ohio Street, State tries to patch this together with Bennett Christian and Patrick Gerd and Jelani Thurman. Um, you know, we did talk, Bill, in the preseason that this was going to be a group that maybe had to lean on all of them anyway. And now that urgency has arrived because I think Will Kazmarek overall has been doing most of the dirty work. And now that yeah. G Scott's going to have to take on more of that. He definitely will. I don't. Who do you think is going to be the the guy who? Is, is second in line there now? Is it going to be Jelani, who I feel like hasn't been used a whole lot, or do you think it will be Bennett Christian? It looks like it's going to be Bennett Christian. Yeah. I, I mean, if you're looking good. for somebody, if you're looking for more of an apples to apples comparison to what Will Kazmarek has brought you, it's probably Bennett Christian. So, yeah. I agree. Bennett Christian, sorry. So if you, I mean, if you're looking to change up the offense a little bit, yeah, there's got to be a role in here somewhere for, for Jelani Thurman, but I, I don't know that the consistency in the blocking game which is what you're losing when you lose Kazmarek. I mean, that feels to me like Bennett Christian is the the heir apparent. I th yeah. think I think Bill, I think Jelani Thurman played two snaps against against Oregon. And again, the injury happened to Will Kazmarek on the first drive, first like what, third play of the game. So there was ample opportunity to get him involved. And I thought it was odd even the week before against Iowa. Or maybe odds not the right word. I thought he must have been injured because he, in mm -hmm. the first half, like didn't even have, you know, his helmet on. He, it was there was no, seemingly no plan to get him involved. Now he did eventually participate in the game, but uh, that's a person where you look at the second half of the season and like, it is not a do or die moment for a second year player. But the opportunity in front of him and the challenge, yeah, could not be more apparent. Yeah, I'm I'm looking at it now. Um, as you were talking, so G ended up playing 55 snaps. Bennett played 20, and yeah, Jelani played two, which was the same amount of snaps that Patrick Gerd played. So clearly, they trust Bennett Christian a little more. It, I, it doesn't. It seems like the 12 personnel stuff has been sort of like a specialty with this offense more than it has been a, a consistent feature. Um. Maybe I'm wrong on that. I should go back and look at what it's actually been. But um, maybe it's not. I, I mean, you don't want to lose Will Kessmer because I think you're right. He is their best tight end. But in terms of what the offense wants to do, just sort of schematically, I don't know that n maybe not being able to play as much tall personnel now moving forward is um, tremendously hindering to what Chip Kelly would like to do. But I could be wrong. But again, I mean, you have to you have to think now ahead. Like, how much does that change without Josh Simmons? Like the 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 it's not just Good losing. Point. Good point. Um, it's not just losing Will Kazmarek. Now you need help more often than you needed before mm -hmm. on on that side of the line. So, like, I, I think that the the obvious answer here is Bennett Christian it plays a lot more, or and maybe we'll see Ohio State do more Bison look the six offensive lineman stuff because there's. You know the twelve. They're gonna figure out the five first. <laughs> you know, yeah, I'm, I'm <laughs> one thing at a time, Burn. I'm just saying, like the the twelve personnel has has not felt like a staple of the offense, but now it, it, you almost have to disguise. You almost have to add an extra layer of protection for for Will Howard out there. So like, you need someone to be the the cold the cold weather gear. I don't I don't know, man. Like it, it's I I think it's great for Ohio State that you get this uh, two weeks to figure it out, but uh, you certainly don't want to have these questions two weeks from now heading into uh, uh, or three weeks from now heading into Penn State because there's only one way Penn State's going to beat Ohio State and that's if Will Will Howard gets eaten alive by Abdul Carter. Mm. Yeah, that's a that's a potentially hairy situation that could be walking into. That's why the Nebraska game is going to be so uh, instructive. Um, I'll I'll buy some stock then because uh, Berm kind of sparked something in my mind there. I'll, I'll buy some stock in like an idea 
in a I guess it's a schematic detail that we saw against Oregon, and that is um, I think we will see Ohio State start to ramp up the two back offense now, whether that's with Emeka Ibuka or with both Travion Henderson and Quinchon Junkins in the backfield at the same time. I I don't want to get like too far over my skis with the offensive line stuff and, and start to assume things before we really see what this looks like. But I can definitely see a scenario where to protect itself, Ohio State re- even starts to lean on the run game even more than it has. And in doing so, Chip's going to have to be a little more creative and you know, equate numbers formationally. And, and I think loading up the backfield with a lot of options is, is one way to do that. So clearly they were holding that back for the Oregon game and then showed it with Emeka Buka. And I thought the couple of times they did it, it looked pretty good. I guess we still haven't seen the Travion and Quinshon together aside from the T formation stuff, but I, I think there's probably more to that as well. So um, I think that will start to be more of a consistent feature of the offense moving forward. So I'll, I'll buy some stock in uh, 21 personnel, I guess it would be, moving forward. I thought they were going to continue to lean on that package with Emeka throughout the game. and I, mm-hmm. I said that before the game, and I definitely felt it in the middle because as soon as they unveiled it, it's like Oregon had no idea how to stop it. Just handing it to Emeka Ibuka is very effective. And then when you start factoring in everything else that can come off that, it becomes pretty terrifying. So I guess that's the only part of the run game. I didn't think that they were going to be able to go just straight ahead at Oregon while they were working through all that stuff in the second half. Clearly the results suggest that they couldn't, but they didn't really try much to go back to whether that is, they did use the the T formation a couple times again, but they didn't. And they, I think Emeka was in the backfield one more time in the second half, but it didn't become, I thought it could be a personnel group that you could run the whole way down the field and put yeah. Oregon in major conflict. And that didn't happen. So that's maybe the one part where, there have been a ton of people that said, oh, Ohio State should have just kept plugging away with the run. I don't think they could have done it in that game in the traditional way that they had in the first five weeks of the season. But one way, as you said, Bill, to get around that is putting a Mecca in the backfield and then putting Oregon uh, in a blender. I wonder, I bet there was more to that and they maybe scrapped it once they started dealing with the offensive line injuries. Because I, 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 I might be slightly off on this, but I think maybe after Josh Simmons went out and then Tegra Shabola was like kind of in and out of the lineup, they only tried sort of like one more like kind of unique run look where it's when they had it was like split backs, but then like also a tight end and like that double whatever sidecar formation people call it. Um, and like the play didn't work. So and then it they just kind of like went back to the normal run game. So it would be understandable, I guess, if off- offensive line injuries cause you to back off back off of some specialty type of plays, but now they know the situation with their offensive line and have two weeks to figure stuff out. And I, I just chip chip is, has no shortage of ideas on how to make a run game go. Um, I think especially when an offensive line might be outmanned a little bit. So I think we'll start to see him really kind of reveal all of his tricks here moving forward. I think that's what has me like my only real frustration coming off this Oregon game is that you can see the reasons why the offense may have dumbed things down or gone back to base looks and simplified things. I am. I guess we're going to go stock down here on the idea of defensive creativity at Ohio State because uh, yeah. I just don't. It doesn't exist, um, and I don't know why it doesn't exist. I don't know if it's entirely Larry Johnson being stubborn. I don't know if it's Jim Knowles getting too far into his head in these uh, talent equated games. Whatever it is, they just refuse to try different things on defense, and uh, I, I'm, I'm sort of over the idea of. Um, waiting for it. Uh, you are not getting productivity from your your superstars, and you're refusing to put in other players. You are not willing to uh, run twists and stunts and do other stuff up front to maybe generate some pressure. You are completely uh, abandoning the idea of press man by refusing to pressure. When you watch Idaho get pressure against Oregon and Michigan State get pressure against Oregon and Boise State gets pressure against Oregon and Ohio State chooses to not really try to get pressure against Oregon. And yes, I've seen the PFF stats and yes, I know that they say that the, no, they didn't. That's just not true. They just, they didn't, they didn't pressure. Um, something has to change on the defensive side of the ball. And, um, you know, Last year, your number two defense in the country, you have all this hype coming in. You have all these guys returning. You say, well, we've got three years in the system. We're going to be able to do this, that, and that, the other thing, and just nothing, nothing new. And I just don't get it. 
you can't so the part that is so irritating at this point is the public insistence that they are getting enough pressure and that there's other ways to impact the quarterback and that it doesn't have to be counted by sacks. Oh, well, because you can design a game plan to get it out. Well, Oregon gave up seven combined sacks to Boise State and Oregon, and their offensive line has played better since those first two games. Um, I Boise think that's State, Yeah, yeah. Uh, the last three games, I don't think they've given up a sack at all to, to Michigan State and UCLA and now Ohio State, but Boise State and Idaho got home. I don't think that they have any five-star defensive ends or uh, preseason All-American defensive tackles. I mean, I, I could be wrong. I didn't I didn't double check that before starting the show. But I mean, teams were able to get to Oregon and to Dylan Gabriel already this season, and Ohio State could not even dream of doing that with its front. It's just this idea. It, it's maddening. You, everyone has seen these players play for three years. They know what they're going to do. They to just say we're going to run our guys out there and run base and, and just going to do what they do. He, Good coaching staffs and good players are easily going to be able to say, okay, I know what JT Tuimolo is going to do. I can just push him off to the side because he is not going to change what he's, he's not changing his rush. He's not looping around. He's not getting any sort of pressure from other, he's not moving inside. Like it, it, it's so predictable and it's so obvious when you watch Ohio state in these talent equated games that the opposing offenses are not afraid of this front four at all. I think that's true. I, I don't, I there's something to the idea of like good offenses usually do that to good defenses. I think like it's the nature of the sport, right? Even some of the top defenses in, in the country this year, like Tennessee gave up a lot of yards to Arkansas. Um, Penn State gave up a bunch of yards and 30 points to sure. USC. Like it, it yeah, happens. I, I think I my, said my, that my, on a rooster show, like I'm not expecting this to be a 10. This isn't 2008 LSU Alabama. Like you're, yeah. you're going to need to score 35 points to win these games, but the difference is Derek Harmon steps up and makes a big play. Exactly. Right. Uh, Mateo yeah. Lingale steps up yeah. and makes a big play. Like Ohio State's defensive linemen are not making plays. So, I, yeah, I just don't think anybody, I don't think anybody on the defense is. I, I just, I have the, in these games, and I guess it's like, it's this game, it's the two Michigan games and um, Georgia. It just feels like Ohio State's defense is constantly on its heels, right? And I, I don't, it is, it is, succeeding succeeding ground in some respect because it doesn't want to give up explosive plays but then it sort of gives them up anyway and they and it's just not responding in kind with its own kind of big plays i've said this a million times so i apologize for repeating myself people might be tired of hearing it but that more than like any scheme whatever like i'm not pretending to be a defensive expert who knows exactly what ohio state should be doing i just know that the defense while giving up probably a little too much also isn't making the kind of splash plays that help counterbalance that. And that yeah. that's the biggest issue for me. And that's an offensive line conversation. It's a defensive backs playing the ball kind of conversation. Like there's, there's playing the go around for everybody, including Jim Knowles, who's obviously the guy running the whole thing. So like, I'm, I'm, I'm like stocked down on defense in general, I guess, only because of the way we talked about it coming into the season. And like that, maybe that's our, not maybe it probably is our fault, right? For, Saying, oh, this has the chance to be the greatest Ohio State defense ever. Look at all this talent. And it's like, well, they're they're good. Are they elite? I don't know that they're elite. I need yeah. to see this defense make more, more big plays and big games before we give them that moniker. I, I just don't, you know, I said it on, on Monday's show at Roosters. Like, I, I actually, I mean, schematically, I think I was fine. Like, at some point, your players need to make plays. And they're just not doing it in these big games. And I... I don't know how much of that is mental. I don't know how much of that is just physical limitations. I, I I don't know. But what I do know is that when you are going into these games now, you it comes down to one or two plays on defense to win the game. And they're just not getting them. And that that's maddening when you look at how much talent and how much potential and how much how high the expectations are. So whatever it is, if it's Jim Knowles and Larry Johnson not getting along, if it's or the perceived feud between them about the Jack position. I, I, or if it's the players themselves, I, I don't know, but like the defense is not going to win Ohio state, a national championship. And that is crazy to me. And I'm not saying Ohio state can't win a national championship with this defense, because I think the offense still has all the tools to be good enough to do it because I don't know that there's a truly great team around college football. Um, but I can't believe here we are October the 16th and it's the offense that it has to carry this team, which is not something I would have imagined five months ago. There's a key in there, Berm, that you said 
it's hard to pin down exactly what's wrong and maybe it's the physical limitations i don't i don't see how that could be an explanation for a defense that has like every i said this to bill on, on tuesday yesterday on the podcast today like I don't think that Nick Saban and Kirby Smart and everybody else that wanted JT Tuimola and Jack Sawyer were wrong about him. I don't, I don't think people are wrong about the athletic ability of Caleb Downs and Lathan Ransom and Denzel Burke and Davis and Igbenosin and Arvell Reese and Sonny Styles and Tyler Williams. Like these are good freaking football players, great athletes. Like I don't, I don't think you can say that there is any world where Ohio State doesn't have the ability to run. The number one defense and be aggressive and come up with like, we spent all of preseason camp saying hey jim Knowles, isn't this fun like you can scheme up any defense you want and he's like oh yeah it's pretty cool said that back in spring it's like well, you can do anything, anything you want put a full menu out there but they're not doing that that's to your point on a stock down of creativity they can do anything they want and they are using these athletes to play base boring fundamental defense and that's why they gave up 32 points to oregon that's the bottom line. You have to put these guys in spots that maximize their chances to make plays. And is that happening for, we, we talked about CJ Hicks all off season. Maybe true linebacker spot is not ever going to connect for him. I think we've probably seen a sample size that suggests that's the case. But there was a reason that we talked about blitzing him. Is that happening in these big games? No, I don't think so. You said even just stuff like twists and stunts and, is that happening? No. Like I don't I don't think you can say about this defense that physical limitations are holding them back. I just don't yeah. I don't I mean, think that I I, I, I don't know that, that what the issue is. That's what I'm saying. Like there's there's clearly something that is not connecting and yeah. there's really no excuse for it that I think makes sense to uh the Ohio State fan base because you have everything at your disposal and you're just doing the exact same things you've done for the last three years. Yeah, I know you were leaving it open ended, but I just want to scratch that off the list because I just I don't I don't think that that's possible to buy as an explanation. But Ooh, Gabe Powers, yeah, hey Gabe Powers could be an option. He was on the Stonk Watch a couple weeks ago. That's all we're going to do on this one because I don't think he played uh, on Saturday. Yeah, well, that went around for a few people. Um, we normally take three apiece, but we would just be talking about the defense and the. The yeah, decline there. So we've already up on Caleb done. Downs. By the way, he's really freaking good. Yeah, he did really well. I don't think he, there's any more of that. <laughs> no, you can't have. I it. didn't say I'm buying it. I'm just saying the price went up. If you, no. I, I'm broke. Did, did anybody else's on defense go up on Saturday? I actually thought Cody Simon played a pretty good game, but uh, maybe I. Uh, I thought Simon played what, a pretty good game. To be honest, I actually didn't hate what I saw from the linebackers. Um. Uh, Caden Curry, I thought played pretty well. I don't know how many snaps he ended up playing, but uh, I think I'd like to see Caden McDonald. I think he played twelve. Yeah, Caden McDonald played eight. Jason Moore played the same as as Caden McDonald. Neither one of them recorded a stat. So, I mean, I think I'd like to see more of that from Caden McDonald. More snaps. I think he's still playing at a pretty high level, but that's PFF numbers and. We're questioning them more than ever based on some of what we've seen from Ohio State. Um, we'll come back to all that, I'm sure. We still have a week and a half to go until Ohio State plays again against Nebraska. Powering through improvement week number two for the Buckeyes. Uh, still number four in the country, so they didn't dip that far in the stonks. Uh, this has been the Podcast Daily for Wednesday. It's Bill Landis and Jeremy Birmingham with me, Austin Ward. We appreciate you. We'll talk to you later.